Welcome to Dinette Discussions. Today is a session, is a two-part series on mental health and chronic illness. My name is Ellen Driscoll, and I'm the president of the board of directors for Dinette. I also live with dysautonomia and other chronic illnesses. If you are new to Dinette, it stands for the Dysautonomia Information Network, a bit of a mouthful. So we call it Dinette. I am joined today with my co-facilitator, Lauren Malak, who is the vice president of Dinette. Hi, Lauren. So I, my name's Lauren. Um, I have had POTS for over 13 years now, amongst many other chronic conditions, um, and found Dinette in a very not great place. Um, so it's been great to be a part of this organization. And as Ellen mentioned, the theme of this discussion is mental health. This session, we are joined with two mental health professionals, um, therapists who have over 20 years experience. And the first is Tina. Um, Tina Borsa is LCMHC, a licensed clinical mental health counselor with over 20 years experience working with children, adolescents, and adults. Tina has also worked with children and adults with disabilities. Currently, Tina is a senior staff clinician and training director for a nonprofit outpatient counseling center. Hi, Tina. Hi, thank you for Hi, having Tina. me here today. We are also joined by Lori Lorman, who is a master's level clinician and who has worked in multiple capacities within the field of mental health most recently working in community mental health, where she has worked as a case manager, a residential counselor, and a children's therapist. We are both very lucky to have both of these women here with us today, not only for their experience as clinicians, but also because both women are caregivers to close family members who live with chronic illness. Tina is a caregiver to her husband, Matt, who lives with a traumatic brain injury and other chronic illnesses and complications from that. Um, Lori is a caregiver to her 36-year-old daughter who was diagnosed at the age of 13 with a brain tumor and has uh, lived with many different chronic illnesses that have resulted not just from the original illness, but also from the many treatments that she had to have as a result of that. Full disclosure, Lori is also my sister, so she has had a front row seat to my learning to live with dysautonomia and all the things that I have gone through since being diagnosed uh, many years ago now. So welcome and thank you both for joining us and giving us your time and your expertise and sharing your personal story. I can only assume as both of you being caregivers as well as therapists that it must have an impact on how you respond therapeutically to your patients, but also as well as the changes that it's had in your life as both a mother and a wife. Can, you know, Tina, you want to start with how that's changed sure. you? Yeah, I think that um, one of the things in my career that I've had to be cautious of is the clients um, that come to me what issues they might have um usually if there is a cancer diagnosis um, and they're coming um, for therapy around um, everything that that encompasses i tend to say that that client would not be a good fit for me i think another therapist might be better suited because i think that it would uh, bring up a lot of personal stuff and i wouldn't be able to be truly present for the client mm. Oh, that makes sense. That's interesting. How about you, Lori? What do you think the impact's been for you? Um, I agree with, with Tina. Um, at the same time, I think sometimes, um, and it actually happened to me just the other day that, um, that I had a client, an adult who was just recently diagnosed with glioblastoma, which is a, wow. a pretty deadly brain tumor. Um, and there is, you know, counter transference when that happens, as Tina mentioned. Um, at the same time, I feel that who better to be empathic about that 
than we are, <laughs> you know, Tina and myself, because we don't just know about it from a clinical professional sense, but we know the devastation that a person feels in dealing with that kind of diagnosis. So, right. So it's a challenge, but I think it's, uh, it's worth it, you know, to it's, be in that it's position. Probably a, I would imagine it's a big benefit to the patient, but it's probably mm -hmm. comes at a great cost to the two of you to have clients that mm -hmm. are going through similar things to what you're experiencing or what your loved one is. So let me ask now about some of the clinical aspects of it. Can you explain the different types of depression that exist? I know that um, there's a high level of depression that comes with chronic illness. And um, we've heard a lot of terms like situational depression versus chronic depression. Is there one, can you explain the difference? And is there one that is more common for people with chronic illness? Um, Lori, do you want to start with that? Uh, the Well, the benefit, if you will, of, of situational depression is that there's a beginning and an end because it usually arises out of either someone going through a divorce, let's say, and then when the divorce is resolved, the symptoms that the person's experiencing resolve themselves, whereas a clinical depression um, has a greater level of hopelessness that goes along with it um, and symptoms that are pretty profound that have a biological component as well as a psychological component. So um, I think it's, it's actually more difficult to treat clinical, true major depressive, um, especially if it becomes a chronic condition than situational. And is that, Tina, do you usually recommend or believe that that the best therapy for clinical depression is medication or is it, are there other better therapeutic approaches? Are they different with situational versus clinical? Yeah, I think that certainly therapy in both situations can be beneficial. It may um, be that in the situational depression, the therapy may be briefer because it's helping that person mm. adjust to mm -hmm. the situation. As Lori said, if it's a divorce and things like that, okay. if it is a more chronic depression, I think there's a longevity um, to the therapy. And I really feel that, that trying therapy first alone can be first see how that goes for someone before mm -hmm. I look at recommending um, looking at medication. But the two hand in hand can work really well. Um, I think that if you're taking medication and you've never done therapy, that you should give that a try. So do you think, In I know this is a very generalized question, but would the depression that comes with being diagnosed with a chronic illness would that be considered more situational? I know they can be both, but because mm. that's kind of, that's a little confusing. I, I know it is to me and I think it is to most people. Is that a situation? Because there's no real resolve to chronic illness, but there is better management and being in a better place about it. There is, but I think um, I view if it's a long-term chronic illness with no cure, I hate to use that word, right. but but no real cure, then I think that most often it becomes a major depression. Um, and as Tina said, I think with therapy, helping the person adjust, if you will, if there is, you know, right. there is adjustment that goes along with it, but helping the person adjust and learn to accept um, and I think it's tricky. I don't mean to make it sound so simple because it's tricky because you don't want acceptance to mean giving up and giving in to the illness. Right. Mm -hmm. However, there's a certain amount of acceptance that has to occur in order for the person to learn how to reinvent themselves. Yeah. Right. Because you have to be able to reinvent yourself if you're, Absolutely. If you're going to move forward. Right. 
So now on the subject of medications from a different angle, um, a lot of people with dysautonomia go on blood pressure meds and other medications that can have their own side effect of dep causing depression in people. So is the, is the symptom, I mean, rather is the, is the treatment the same, whether it's as like, say you have to be on blood pressure meds and you have no choice, you have to be, but it causes some depression in you. Is that a therapeutic approach or is there another medication that's given to counter that? Or what does a person do if they're kind of stuck with that? Yeah, I think that definitely um, there are, I think we've all seen that on TV where there'll be a medication that's advertised and then there's a this list and small print <laughs> of all the side effects that could be. Mm -hmm. So if someone has a side effect of, let's say, depression from that medication, it's unfortunate, but sometimes um, they do need to take a medication to treat that depression. Mm -hmm. um, it may not be, um, depending on the severity of the side effect of depression, it may not need to be a high dose, um, but um, it is uh, something that's unfortunate with side effects. Right. Mm -hmm especially with blood pressure meds, I know have a lot of uh, side effects like that. And that's one of the more common medications that people with dysautonomia are on. So yeah. do anti-seizure medications, as we well yes. know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And that's really tough for the patient, the person living mm -hmm. with the illness, because you're, you know, you're taking something they're telling you to take that will help you with your symptoms. But mm -hmm. then if that comes with side effects of their own, then you're treating that. And the layers sometimes become so complex in a treatment plan that a lot of times we hear from people who aren't sure what is, is this part of dysautonomia? Is this part of my medications? Is this, mm -hmm. is it this a mental capacity that I'm not handling this well? You know, it becomes kind of a quagmire of uh, symptoms, treatment versus illness. Um, so now anxiety is the other thing that is a very, um, big issue for people with dysautonomia for a number of reasons, which we'll get into later on, but are there different types of anxiety the way there are different types of depression? Different symptoms with depression, uh, with anxiety that, that, um, that happen, you know, some people have heart palpitations, some people have um, hyperventilation, some people, you know, sweat a lot or ha have full-blown panic attacks. Well, and that was going to be my follow-up question because people presenting with dysautonomia frequently are told that what yeah. they are experiencing is a panic attack versus mm -hmm. an episode because just as you mentioned, sweating, Heart palpitations, <laughs> shortness of breath, dizziness. It's similar. Those are all, mm -hmm. Yes, right? They're classic symptoms of POTS and other forms of dysautonomia. So um, I was very lucky in that my uh, doctor knew me very well. And so when I said, a cardiologist said I'm having panic attacks, she said, no, <laughs> you're not. Mm -hmm. But most people aren't. Lauren, didn't you go through? <laughs> you were told it was panic, weren't you? Yeah. So I was in elementary school and the school nurse, cause I kept going and cause I didn't feel good during class. And she kept telling my mom that there must be something going on at school, that it's just anxiety. You need to push me, you know, maybe, you know, there's a mean girl or something else is going on. And sure enough, it was dysautonomia. So, so now what, is there anything that um, either one of you can share that what is a classic panic attack and how does that differ from a physi the physiology of say having heart palpitations and and sweating and the other symptoms that i mentioned what is the like is there a classic difference i think that they can th the symptoms are definitely sim similar mm -hmm. um now i i don't know this enough so you'd have to tell me um where anxiety could be brought on something triggering it 
But I'm wondering with um, dysautonomia or POTS, can, um, I'm wondering if there's a trigger there too to Mm. the panic attack. Not usually. Not usually. I mean, usually it's something as simple as standing up and taking a few steps or, I mean, certainly there can be, and it becomes really difficult for people uh, who have these episodes because the more you, especially before you're diagnosed, the more you have these episodes, then you can't trust yourself. So right. then you do become very anxious about going out in public, being alone when you're out because you're afraid something's going to happen to you and you won't be able to help yourself. Yeah. Um, and then that adds to the misdiagnosis because mm-hmm. then, you know, you, but it's, that's, it's the, the chicken or the egg sort of situation. Mm-hmm. Cases, it's you become anxious because you're having the episodes, not having the episodes because you're anxious. Um, I was told once by a doctor, and I don't know if this is true, that a classic symptom of a panic attack is a feeling of dread or doom right before you start having the symptoms, that there's something in your head, as you said, Tina, like a trigger that makes you start to feel First, the perception of doom, something terrible is going to happen, and then followed by the physical symptoms. Is that accurate? I don't think in every case. I think in some cases, yes. But um, but the symptoms can be, are very similar to what we talked about with generalized anxiety. The shortness of breath, the feeling that you might be having a heart attack. I think it's more intense if you're in the middle of the throes of a panic attack than just with garden variety anxiety but right right it's not pleasant so, <laughs> neither it is one very is unpleasant pleasant yeah and mm. the the episodes that people with dysautonomia have that mimic panic attacks mm. are extremely unpleasant yeah. and you you do i mean everyone i think um, starts to come up with their own techniques, if you will, of mm. how to talk yourself down so that you don't, because anxiety increases, it exacerbates the episode, it doesn't cause them, mm. but it exacerbates it for sure. Yeah, sure. Right. So, um, you know, for me, it's, it's kind of telling myself in my head, this is going to pay, it's going to be over soon. It's going to be over mm-hmm. soon. <laughs> you know, over and over again, because in the beginning, when I didn't know what it was, and this is pretty common, you feel like you're dying. You feel like they're missing Mm -hmm. something and my heart's going to stop any second now. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think there are different coping mechanisms like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Skills might be a better term for it as Mm -hmm. far as using positive Mm -hmm. self-talk. There is... um, Certainly one of the um, interventions that I use with clients is emotional freedom technique, not sure you may know mm-hmm. of tapping. Yep. I just did that mm-hmm. um, earlier. What is that? Uh, Can you explain that to me? I don't know that. Yeah, emotional freedom technique um, was originally founded by Gary Craig um, and um, it is um, self-acupressure is what it is. Oh, so it's okay. tapping on the certain acupressure points, like I'm tapping now right. and so forth. And you're saying things out, out loud or to yourself. Um, like, you know, I, th- this too will pass. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. This feels really uncomfortable and mm-hmm. it's just, you know, tapping on what's going on. And that's really hard to do in a, in the midst of a mm-hmm. panic attack, mm. but if certainly you get that dread piece right. coming up, that can be an indication of maybe I need to use one of my coping skills and let me try that. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. This is kind of a, a medical question, but I, 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 you don't need to speak to the physiology, but just the general theme of it. Um, with autonomic dysfunction, which is what dysautonomia is in different forms, um, for many forms of it, there is a an overdrive to the sympathetic uh, nervous system. 
So there's a, a big release of norepinephrine that happens inside our bodies, which causes the fight or flight to go mm. through the roof. And that is the feeling is that, you know, a bear is coming at us, ready to eat us. That's the, <laughs> the sensation. And we have all the symptoms that go along with that. So I'm curious as to what effect, if any, a this can have on a person's general anxiety level. In other words, if you're always operating or frequently mm. operating with this heightened fight or flight thing going on in your body, can that actually cause anxiety or depression even for that matter? I think it's similar to um, people who suffer from PTSD mm. who are always in fight or flight mode um, because they're they're always on alert to disaster, if you will, right? So right. So if it's someone who um, who suffers from any kind of a chronic condition that's scary because you don't know if you're gonna fall down, you don't know if you're you know gonna crash a car, I would assume if you're having an episode right. behind the wheel. Um, you're always on, you're always in fight or flight mode in a sense. Right. So I think that it goes hand in hand with depression because just that realization of that limitation on your life, especially, you know, for someone, Lauren, like, you know, someone young, right. Um, not to minimize your struggle, Alan, but I mean, no, I think but it's for, true for someone who's young to kind of have that hanging over your head is very debilitating yeah it just very debilitating yeah it Ellen is. and I had a long discussion a week or two ago talking about how age plays you know a big part of it not that one is better or worse mm -hmm. but she got diagnosed at a very different time of life than I did um mm -hmm. and how finding your identity is very different after having you know, a job and a career versus still being in school and trying to just start to get that independence. And it's, yes, it's a big difference. And again, one's not better than the other, but mm -hmm. it's a different set of struggles that you go through. Um, yeah. I actually life, think, I yeah, I yeah. actually think one is better than the other. But in, I don't think so. No. In, in this sense that I had mentioned to you, mm -hmm. when you're, I was in my 50s when I was diagnosed, uh, I became disabled from other things when I was 40. But when I yeah. got the diagnosis for dysautonomia, I was around 50. And here's the major difference that I think makes a world of difference. When you are older, yes, you lose a lot. Whereas when you're mm -hmm. younger, you lose the promise the opportunity right. mm -hmm. for things. Mm -hmm. When you're older, you lose what you've already been, how you've identified yourself for all these years. However, the big difference is you have resilience. You have, mm -hmm. you've lived long enough as an older person to know, you know, that you can get through this, that life mm -hmm. changes all the time, that this, you know, and, and at 50, I already knew that, that my, my, I didn't expect my health to decline like that, but I mm. did know that there were going to be a lot of limitations on my life as I grew mm. older. That mm -hmm. naturally happens. Or when you're your age, 12, that you yeah. were when you mm. were diagnosed. My niece, Lori's daughter, was mm. 13. It's it's You're being robbed and you don't have the ability to know, oh, I can get through this. I can just reinvent myself mm. again. Yeah. Mm. Don't you, Tina, don't you think it's, if Matt were much younger, you've worked with adolescents. So you must see that a lot, that difference. Yeah, I think like Matt was um, diagnosed in his 20s. Um, so um, with a, um, aglio-dendroglioma um, tumor. And I, I feel like he... It, it certainly stunted a period of time, obviously, when he was going through the brain surgery and the treatments and all of that. But he 
he had a miraculous kind of recovery in that the cancer didn't go away, but mm -hmm. he was, he returned to really um, fully functioning for the most part mm -hmm. and was able to, you know, work then as an engineer right. and everything, which is, which is different than where he is now and isn't yeah. able to do right. that. Mm -hmm. But when he was, he had, when I, I think sometimes, you know how it comes up on your phone memories. Yeah. Um, yes. And I look back at the years that, it can be sad sometimes. Sometimes I purposely mm -hmm. on him because I'll look back at how functional he was in his younger years. Mm -hmm. And, and then I see the decline, like he can't mm -hmm. ride a bike anymore or he can't mm -hmm. ride a bike right. anymore. And yeah. And it is, that's one of the things that's very hard as a patient. And I can see, I appreciate hearing from the two of you because I think as people living with the illness, you don't always realize the impact it has on the loved ones who are caring for you. Mm. You know, you feel the sadness for yourself. Um, we've talked about this. Um, Lauren and I have talked about this regarding her mom, who was at home with her in the initial time. And yeah. her mother's um, ability to, or her struggle to probably, mm. um, allow Lauren to become more independent mm. now because that was all taken away as like what happened with Jessica, mm -hmm. with Lori's daughter, you know, just at a point when she should have be, been becoming more independent, she suddenly mm -hmm. became fully dependent. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been a challenge, you know, growing up, I, you know, as a kid, you are dependent on your parents, but I mm -hmm. became so much more because she was my advocate and she was the one taking mm -hmm. appointments and mm -hmm. keeping my medical records and all this. And I actually, due to that, developed um, separation anxiety for a while mm -hmm. because nobody else understood it. Nobody else knew what I was going through um, mm -hmm. and very slowly having to kind of find my own way in little bits of independence it's it's a challenge but it's something that I've slowly been able to gain back and sadly some people my age aren't even able mm. to do that um, mm -hmm. which I think would be incredibly challenging and Ellen and I were saying you know I can't imagine not having that support system um, I'm right. very grateful that I did because I think that's helped tremendously mm -hmm. but to people who don't have that that's yeah. their organizations and talking to people who know what you're going through really, really come in handy because you need somebody. <laughs> I mean, you lose right. so many people through Absolutely. that problem anyway, that it, it's just a very unfortunate thing that it, it is important to have that support. Well, and I, I just want to add one thing yeah. there that, um, as a caregiver, mm -hmm. Um, I think it's also incredibly difficult. I know Tina struggles with Tina and I have talked about this and I'm sure if I spoke to your mom, Lauren, you know, she would understand, I could, re she could relate to this. You want to help the person. You want to be there for them. At the same time, you don't mean to enable them, mm -hmm. but it's a natural process that happens because you, you don't know where to draw the line right. between the help that somebody really needs. I mean, I've seen, for instance, I've seen Tina's husband get annoyed with her when she tries to help him. I've seen my own daughter countless times get very annoyed with me when I try to help her. She complains but, to me. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know the line between when she needs help sometimes and when she can handle it on her own. And I shared with Alan that the last time I was out with Tina and her husband, um, Tina was in the bathroom and he went to get up and his, and his leg was sort of not paralyzed, but it got kind of got stuck, mm -hmm. you know, so he was having a hard time getting. So I automatically, went up behind him and was sort of, you know, trying to help him. And he, but, but he said, because I'm not his wife, he didn't get mad at me. Right. And he just said, no, I've, I've got it. I'm okay. And I, and I was able to step back and let him do it, but it's, 
it's hard for the caregiver too to yeah to I agree witness. and I I think that's where for the people living with chronic illness that are watching this there's mm -hmm. a really big point to be made um towards our responsibility to communicate what we need mm -hmm. and what we don't need mm -hmm. um because it is very tough um my husband from time to time has needed caregiving with some of the chronic illnesses that he has. So I've kind of been on both sides of it. Mm -hmm. And it is really difficult to know what to do for a person and when to pull back or when to push them to take care of themselves more mm -hmm. or, or when they really need you. So as people living with the chronic illness, you know, we need to learn how to not just get annoyed when somebody tries <laughs> to help us, but explain what it is. When you do that, mom, for instance, mm. it makes me feel like a baby. It embarrasses mm -hmm. me in front of people. Whatever whatever it is, I think mm -hmm. we need to do more than just say, now I don't need your help. <laughs> you know, <'cause> that <laughs> right. you know, Or complaining that they're not doing enough. Same mm -hmm. is true. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people don't know what to do and identifying where you need help. Like, no, I don't need you to make my coffee and bring it to me, but it would really help me if you would help me get my shoes on because that's mm -hmm. difficult for me to bend down. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, we have a responsibility in this too, I think. And I think mm -hmm. that there's there's a, something that um, my husband and I are um, trying to contend with now and causes tension um, in our marriage is that um, there's an irritability. So it's a mm -hmm. the side effect from his anti seizure med, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Aware we're aware of that, um, that that can be a side effect. But then I wonder sometimes that irritability is that depression, and it mm -hmm. gets really complicated. Like we were talking mm -hmm. earlier about the anxiety piece, mm -hmm. um, and right now that's something that I'm trying to figure out. Is that irritability that he has right now some depression coming up uh, because at, at his age at 52 he thought mm -hmm. he'd be in a different place in his mm -hmm. and he's grieving well, okay. that loss 